It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. We're continuing our series talking with authors of the Brief Theological Introductions to the Book of Mormon. Adam Miller's here in this episode to talk about his volume on Mormon, a book that he calls A Beginner's Guide to the End of the World. Mormon testifies of Christ even as everything he loves seems to be slipping through his fingers. For the last few episodes in this series, we wanted to get series editors on the mic to talk to the authors. So this episode features a guest host, Spencer Fluman, executive director of the Maxwell Institute and co-editor of the Brief Theological Introductions to the Book of Mormon series. Questions and comments can be sent to me at mipodcast.byu.edu. And now it's Spencer Fluman guest hosting with Adam Miller talking about Mormon, a brief theological introduction. Friends, I'm Spencer Fluman. Uh, guest host of the uh, Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm here with Dr. Adam Miller. Welcome to the podcast, Adam. It's my pleasure to be on the podcast. My honor to be interviewed by you personally. Is uh, This isn't your first rodeo on the podcast. Uh, we, we owe you some kind of, I, I think you get a jacket by this point or something. A letterman's jacket? I get a letter. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. Thanks for coming on again. Uh, we're here to talk about a lightning strike of a book that you have written called Mormon, A Brief Theological Introduction, part of our Maxwell Institute series uh, on the, the Book of Mormon, Brief Theological Introductions. You've written a lot of books, but this one's your favorite. <laughs> uh, whichever one came out most recently is always my favorite. <laughs> or about to come out. Uh, yeah, this one, this one, uh, this one is marvelous. I'm a, I'm a fan of, uh, of all you write, but this one's marvelous. Uh, I've read it twice now and it wasn't diminished on the second reading. I'm glad to report. Um, I loved it every bit as much on the second reading as the first. I want to start, um, by having you, um, talk through the way you see Mormon's book as a whole. Um, you describe it early on as a beginner's guide to the end of the world. What brought you to that and what, what do you intend uh, in, in, in reading Mormon's book this way? Well, I think there are a lot of different ways that we could read Mormon's book, but this was a way that appealed to me. I think the appeal to me was to, to read his experience as a kind of lens onto what it's like as a disciple of Jesus Christ to find yourself living through the loss of all things. Uh, and in that respect, though Mormon's example is a pretty dramatic example of what that looks like, I think that's a kind of shared universal feature of discipleship. The basic problem that we find ourselves facing as human beings is that the world is continually passing away. And we are continually, all of us, whether quickly or slowly, uh, gradually or dramatically, losing all things as the world passes away beneath our feet. And Christian discipleship, I think, uh, can be profitably understood as a response to that basic problem that we all find ourselves facing, and that I think Mormon faces in a really dramatic and a really uh, helpful way. You resist seeing Mormon as I pictured him as a kid, as just a historian or chronicler of a kind of sad story about his civilization. He's not just a historian. And I, I take some umbrage at that implication of your book, by the way, as a historian, I'm, uh -huh. I, I, I hear you. I hear what you do. I see you. I see you. I see what you're doing. But for you, Mormon um, is using the past in a particular way to do a particular kind of work that's visionary and prophetic. So, it's a different view of Mormon than at least some of us have. He's not just a, a chronicler. He's not just an editor. He's modeling something about a certain kind of religion in a certain kind of world. But as you say, that matters to us now. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, Mormon clearly interested in history, but I think it's also clear that for Mormon, He's always interested in history as raw material. He's interested in history as raw material for helping him to generate his witness of Christ. His witness both for why we need Christ and how Christ can intervene uh, and respond to the kinds of problems that we face, whether that's in the past or whether that's in the present. 
if there's a kind of distinctive editorial feature of Mormon's own specific book, I think it's the fact that he continually breaks the fourth wall and continually reaches out to address us future readers as if we were present, implicating us, uh, I think, in the live power of Christ as it's manifest in the things that he's writing about, even if the raw material for what he's writing is historical. Your comment about um, raw materials uh, brings to mind another portion of your book, actually, uh, that I... I, I can't help but um, kind of circle to, and that is uh, early on, you, you, you talk about the raw materials that you work with as a philosopher and as a theologian in particular. I mean, all, all the series authors in the series are, are modeling a certain kind of um, craft of a, of, a, of a theologian, even if it's a lowercase t. So spend a couple of minutes... Uh, Adam, and, and reflect on the raw, ma raw materials that you had to work with as the writer of the book, because in some ways I think this relates to, at least to me as a reader, uh, that relates to the, the, the model that you see in Mormon. What's it like to be a theologian like you reading a text like this? How do you do it? Yeah, I see Mormon as a witness of Christ who uses the historical materials for the sake of that witness. Now, for me, as a theologian here, writing explicitly as a theologian, especially in this series of books, uh, I view the theological project basically in those same terms. There's a lot of different ways to do theology and to think about theology, but for me, the business of theology always comes back to the business of offering a witness of Christ and offering a witness of Christ, not just as something uh, that happened to other people a long time ago, but as a witness of, of Christ's live, ongoing power at work in the world around us, uh, right here, right now. I, 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 don't, I don't practice theology as a form of history. I'm not asking questions about what religious people did believe or say or do, or even as a form of official dogmatics where we might ask what should religious pe people believe or say or do, but as instead a kind of direct investigation right here, right now, into how Christ manifests in our world. Uh, and then I take up, I think, in a very similar way to Mormon himself did with the historical materials, I take Mormon himself up as raw material here for a reflection not on Mormon or even his historicity, but a reflection by way of Mormon on Christ himself. You invent a term for this, in fact, in the book, um, it, that it, it's fancy sounding, but it, you, you call yourself a Christophysicist, which will grab some, and I think it'll stop readers and say, now what? But that's what you're getting at. You're, you're, you express a kind of concern that if we only treat these texts as artifacts that even Christ risks being treated as an artifact. It seems like you're kind of worrying that theology not get pushed out of the intellectual life of the Latter-day Saints, lest we, in your words, bracket Christ. Yeah, I think that's right. I think we run the risk uh, if we prioritize history or even exclusively prioritize historical concerns uh, we risk bracketing Christ from our reflections on our religion. Uh, and at the end of the day, our religion can't be about itself without being an empty shell. At the end of the day, our religion must be about Christ, or our, re or our religion has failed. And so, thus, I think at the end of the day, all of our reflections on our religion, even historical reflections, must come back to the question of being reflections on Christ himself on the fundamental problems that we experience as human beings and on how Christ as a live power right here and now responds to those fundamental problems. Thanks for that. Um, I, I take all of that um, as, as friendly fire to your um, fellow striving historians. Uh, so I, I take it with, uh, with all the goodness that you intend there, Adam, no doubt. And I want to loop back now uh, to Mormon's book itself and, and maybe to Mormon again, because you see in Mormon a kind of mood, uh, a kind of disposition. 
that for you is a is is meaningful for modern day saints and it's a kind of well you you've written it in a kind of haunting way frankly i can't i can't kind of quit thinking about it because it it seems to defy a kind of um cheeriness that we latter day saints are known for we're we're kind of durably cheerful uh, more than one commentator has noted the Disney-esque character of some parts of our, our culture, but, but th this is not that kind of story, and this is not that kind of voice that you find in Mormon. So talk through why this mood of Mormon, this sober mood, this disposition, is theologically significant. One of the things that struck me first when I started working on reading carefully through Mormon's own book in the Book of Mormon was the repeated self-descriptions that we get of him. Uh, first reported by him from Amaron, where Amaron uh, claims that he's going to vouchsafe the records to Mormon because Mormon is, quote, sober and quick to observe. He's sober and quick to observe. And then just a few verses later, when Mormon is explaining to us why he is personally visited by Jesus Christ, the only reason he gives is the fact that he was sober. He was somewhat of a sober mind, uh, he says, adding a little qualifier there, when the description is not in his own, when the description is now in his own voice. Uh, but that really struck me that here we have a man living through the end of the world as a witness of Christ, exemplifying what it looks like to be a disciple under those circumstances. Uh, and what we see, what characterizes him on his, by his own account, what most characterizes him is the fact that he is sober. Uh, he has this kind of uh, deep attunement to the kind of trouble and tragedy and loss that's inherent in the world. That's inherent to the fact that whether it's happening in this dr really dramatic way like it does to him or whether it's happening in a much more ordinary, subtle way like it does to most of us, our lives are passing away, we're getting old, we're losing our loved ones, all of our goals and dreams and aspirations are evaporating before our eyes, <laughs> uh, even, if we, even if we achieve some of them the way that we thought that we might, we might want to. Uh, but all of this, the whole thing is all passing away. And he models this brand of discipleship in which instead of avoiding all of that trouble or jumping over all of those losses, he models this kind of discipleship in which he is soberly attuned to all of this trouble. And that puts him in a position then, I think, to do something about it. In the same way that we see, for instance, Christ as a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, who is then empowered as a result to respond to all these troubles, when if we try to skip over them, uh, we've missed the heart of discipleship itself. So here we have Mormon and his contemporaries, uh, I mean, uh, his people that he loves and he's watching them crumble to dust um, figuratively and literally. He's experiencing the same nightmare of decline and loss and so on. But this, this, this cataclysmic stretch that he and his people are passing through is a kind of prism. You know, he's refracting through it differently than they're refracting through it. They're, they're both experiencing the same chaos and mayhem and terror. There's no other word for it. It's terror. They're experiencing, but, he, but he's going through it differently, as you say. He's, he's positioned differently. He's experiencing it differently. And so you draw a distinction in the book between mere loss and sacrifice, that he's doing one and they're doing the other. Elaborate on that, would you? What, what meanings do you tease out there for readers in the book? Yeah, this is the, I would say, the basic template that I use to understand the kind of discipleship that Mormon is modeling. That Christian discipleship as Mormon models it occurs at the crossroads of two things. On the one hand it occurs at the at the junction of, of a certain kind of world and on the, on the other hand it occurs at the junction of that world with a certain kind of religion. What kind of world? A world in which we are all of us guaranteed to lose all things. As Joseph Smith himself put it, everything that has a beginning has an end. That's pretty brutal. Most things have a beginning. <laughs> everything that has a beginning has an end. Uh, that's the world that we live in. We will all lose all things. 
but Christian discipleship uh, adds to that world, uh, responds to that world with a certain kind of religion, a religion that is grounded in the premise that we have to learn how to sacrifice all things. As the, as the lectures on faith put it, right? any religion that does not require the sacrifice of all things has not the power to produce the faith necessary unto life and salvation. This is ground zero for the practice of Christian discipleship. Christian discipleship is carried out as the business of learning how to sacrifice all things rather than cling to all things. And what Mormon models, I think, is the fact that the only, uh, the only Christian and redemptive response to the fact of losing all things is a willingness on our part to not just lose them, but to, you know, to, to willingly sacrifice our claim to them in the process so that we can, by way of this redemptive sacrifice, avoid, kind of avoid sheer ruin and find instead the possibility of continually new beginnings in Christ. And that, that strikes me as uh, a nice bridge toward a, a really thoughtful and for me helpful conversation about creation. Because for you, this perpetual losing, <laughs> which itself feels so at odds with so much of Western culture to me. With so much of which is, is built around the, uh, around the avoidance <laughs> of this very fact, yeah. Exactly. In fact, you you portray the his contem Mormon's contemporaries as as with a, a literal death grip on their possessions in a kind of fantasy of permanence or <laughs> security or what have you. But it but it's not a it's not a hopelessness that comes with that. That's we we shouldn't misread Mormon as a kind of hopeless resignation to loss that that this the world as it is points to god as god is that every loss is a beginning as well if every beginning has an end these ends have beginnings and the world in your words the world is constantly being recreated you you worry about us framing creation in the past tense only Say more about that, if you would. If we ask ourselves the question, why is the world always ending? Why is it continually passing away? The answer is that because the world is always beginning again. Right? God didn't just create the world once in the past. He's continually creating and recreating the world, moment by moment, day by day, again and again, over and over. The process of creation rolls forward. And the question for us as disciples is whether or not we are going to participate willingly in this business of continually recreating the world or whether we're going to fight against it. And what it looks like to willingly participate in the creation of a new world uh, is to willingly sacrifice our hold on the old one. We have to willingly sacrifice our claim to all of these old worlds as they pass away in order to get on board with God's program of continually creating new ones. Uh, this is something that Mormon, uh, what Moroni in particular in the latter in the later chapters of Mormon himself emphasizes when he uh, hammers home the point again and again that the day of miracles has not passed. The day of miracles has not ceased. And his Moroni's number one example of the miracles that have not ceased is creation itself. God's ongoing work of creation. That's the, in particular the miracle he has in mind. And so... What happens is, is that if you and I are willing, like Mormon, to engage in sacrificing all things as we lose all things, this aligns us with God's own will and allows us to participate in the world's recreation as something new, as something that uh, better manifests God's own image. This is, uh, you portray a kind of risky God here, in a way. You, you, uh, you note that there are safer gods. <laughs> There are safer gods to create um, mentally, you know, a, a god who is kind of presiding over a static known thing that is that he's in fact preserving and securing. But this god is riskier because of this continual act of recreation. What, what I love about your comment here, too, honestly, is that it points to me. Uh, at one point in the book, you, you say <laughs> people are more like rivers than rocks in that we ourselves 
if we'll see it this way, we uh, can let ourselves be caught up in this same transformative becoming, recreation, uh, rather than holding, again, death grip-like onto possessions or status or moments or whatever. People. People. That's hard work, though. This is hard work. Is this the, is this, is this the book we wanted? <laughs> <laughs> this, this is this is, the book we wanted in the Book of Mormon? This is not, this is neither, the best I can tell, this is neither the book nor the world uh, that most of us would by default uh, evidently prefer. There's something really striking about the way that Mormon and Moroni also both, uh, both insist on our seeing God not just as the creator of the world, uh, but to come back again and again to the fact uh, that those who are denying God are also in part denying the fact that God, as Christ, will come down and sacrifice himself on our behalf as the Lamb of God. Uh, to deny God is to deny God not only as the Creator, as we uh, try to opt out of participating in that continual work of recreation, but to deny the fact that God himself is in the business of sacrificing all things. That there are no exceptions to the rule here, that everyone must sacrifice all things, and this includes God himself, who models for us, even better than Mormon himself, how to engage in the work of redeeming all things by sacrificing all things, even as all things are lost in the business of recreating all things. And that strikes me as an entirely different sense of the cost of discipleship. We would, I suspect, like to partition off that sacrificial self-offering from what Christ-likeness looks like in the world. We'd rather treat people nicely and forgive the slights, but that, that kind of sacrifice is, is something different. I, I've got a passage here I want to read from the book. It um, stopped me in my tracks and um, gets at this kind of life that you call apocalyptic discipleship, and it's about living in the Spirit. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read a portion here, quoting you to you, Adam Miller. To live without God in the world is to live without the Spirit. It is to live without the constant recreative push of that Spirit striving with you. Spirit strives. It pushes and pulls and strains. Spirit materializes at the bleeding edge of the world's recreation. It materializes at the white hot tip of time's spear, at the point where the future passes through the crucible of the, pres of the present to become the past. Talk me through that passage. It's rich language, but it, it's calling me to, living, to live in a different kind of way uh, in the world. Yeah, I think it's calling for us to, to be engaged at whatever it is that we're doing, to show up for it, to be here, present tense, uh, right here, right now, doing what we're doing, full attention, with love and compassion. I think this is, as a practical matter, probably the most predictable fruit of the Spirit, that the Spirit makes you feel alive. It fills you with life. You feel plugged in to the fabric of reality, to the people that you're with, to the thing that you're doing. And in the process, you lose yourself because you have sacrificed yourself to whatever it is that you're doing. You've sacrificed your ego, you've sacrificed your own concerns, and you've lost yourself in the work of caring for the present moment, whatever that looked like. Whether that was having dinner with your family, or whether that was uh, grading papers in the afternoon, or whether that was doing a podcast, with Spencer Fluman, whatever it is, right? All, all in, right? Right here, right now, sacrificing all of it. That's, and that's where the spirit shows up uh, when we feel plugged in and alive in that way because we're sacrificing ourselves for the sake of what we're doing. The contemporaries of Mormon in your hands um, typically form a kind of nice foil to this very kind of living. That they're almost, they're almost zombies in your hands. Um, I might be overstating, but they're, they're, they're the walking dead. There's almost an, ine an inevitability to their demise because they've, 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 they've already lost in some ways in that, again, that they're, they're denying 
that loss. They're denying the kind of sacrificial losing that you're talking about. They're they're holding on so tightly to everything that it's almost a numbing kind of effect for them. And I saw in that myself in some ways and our lives in that way, busy as they are, filled with stuff as they are, distracted as they are. You say that sin in the book is, is living in this kind of denial. Uh, tell us more about what Mormon's book taught you about sin and this kind of denial of the of the the grain of the universe as you said zombies is a nice description the walking dead i think is fair to say is a quasi scriptural description what does it mean to be someone who is living in sin to be someone who is living in sin is to be someone who is spiritually dead you are nominally alive <laughs> physically <laughs> but you're not really alive. You're, the most important part of you, your spirit, is dead. Uh, and you end up in this position of spiritual death when, scared of losing everything, you refuse to willingly participate in the work of creating new life, in the work of creating a new world. And you cling to all the things that you have and you don't let them go and you won't sacrifice them and you won't consecrate them and you won't give them back to God. And you invest your time and effort here into, into creating an illusion of stability, to creating a kind of fantasy world in which you won't have to lose all things. And you might even enlist your own religion in helping you to construct this fantasy world in which you won't, like God, have to sacrifice everything. Uh, and then you end up in this position in which you have effectively uh, killed yourself, killed or put to death part of yourself. The cost of that fantasy is the fact that you've had to unplug from reality and no longer participate in the present moment because that's where all of the losses are happening. And you try to wall yourself off either into memories from the past or fantasies about how you want things to be in the future. Uh, and you feel numb and empty. And everything that you do feels meaningless and pointless because you're not willing to sacrifice in order to be part of what God is going to do with or without you. I'm glad you agreed with my zombie reading of your reading. That's just um, that's just straight up, straight out of the scriptures, as far as I can tell. Well, yeah, uh, and I, um, your descriptions again of of that kind of life, that life desperate to not lose anything else struck me as um, so haunting in the present that I it, it, it kind of helped conjure that. But again, it points to a, for me at least, a, a different kind of, a different kind of God than we might imagine to ourselves. I've got another paragraph that I want to read to you that you wrote. It's my favorite Have thing. Please continue. <laughs> <laughs> this is Adam Miller. Uh, from Mormon, A Brief Theological Introduction, roundabout page 109. Atoning sacrifice isn't simply what is required after the fact, as a kind of cosmic band-aid, because the law, which wouldn't have needed sacrifice otherwise, was broken. God's own atoning act of sacrifice wasn't the backup plan, rather, because the law can only ever be fulfilled by way of love and sacrifice, the whole plan of redemption works the other way around. The fantasy that sacrifice is avoidable even to God is what broke the law in the first place. So how, does, how should that change the way we understand our relationship to God? We can start, I think, with a kind of big picture view here about the way that the story, the Christian story, is traditionally told outside of the Latter-day Saints, right? outside of the context of the Restoration. Traditionally, the Christian story goes something like this. God, who never changes, who is not subject to time in any way like the rest of us, creates a world. Adam and Eve sin. As a result, all kinds of suffering and loss enter into the world as a kind of punishment. Uh, and if we manage to make it our way out of this world, uh, because God then had to, of necessity, sacrifice himself to fix what we broke, we will go back to that world where God is, where nothing changes, where there's no such thing as loss or creation or transformation. That's a traditional version of the story. 
I don't think that's the version of the story that we as Latter-day Saints can accept, uh, if only because on our version of the story, uh, this world, mortality itself, uh, is not a total loss, but one of the very greatest gifts that God could have given us to participate in this world, in these bodies, in this continual process of transformation. And the way that we Latter-day Saints tell the story, God is not separate from this whole process of change and transformation and creation. He's in the thick of it with us. And the fact that he's in the thick of it with us, sacrificing all things for us in the same way that we're called to sacrifice all things, isn't his way of putting a band-aid on something that was broken because we weren't supposed to lose everything, but is in fact part and parcel of the way things were meant to be from the beginning, if from the beginning, progression and creation and ongoing transformation were not just for us, but for all things, the order of the day. Which means I think that we, we probably need to do a better job of separating ourselves from the rest of the Christian tradition in this respect, so that we can be clearer about the nature of what's going on in Christ's atonement, uh, and exactly what kind of problem his atonement is meant to solve. And it's not the kind of problem, I think, that traditional Christianity thinks it is. You, um, that's beautiful, by the way. And uh, gets me thinking uh, a little bit pastorally, uh, to be honest. Um, if my day job is, as a scholar and administrator, my evening and weekend job is, is different. And it's more pastorally <laughs> oriented. And you... You, your book asks us to think about imperfections differently as well. And I see this as a, as a symptom of a kind of problem for modern Latter-day Saints, um, as, a, as a hyper-focus on imperfections. But, but here you, you, you highlight the fact that Mormon, Moroni to a certain extent, uh, the word imperfections pops up here kind of prominently. How does Mormon's book help us kind of reorient towards the world's imperfections, and towards our own as well. If I remember my own book correctly, which I may not because I wrote it more than a year ago now, <laughs> but <laughs> the word imperfections is only used five times, I think, in the scriptures, and all five of them in Mormon, right? It comes yeah. up repeatedly as Moroni frets a bit about the imperfections yeah. of the record and what our response to these imperfections will be. If you were to ask me, what does it look like as a practical matter on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, to go about the business of sacrificing all things? I think the best answer I could give to that sort of question is that the actual work of sacrificing all things looks like the continual work of forgiving all things. It looks like the continual work of forgiving the world the fact that it is passing away, that it is not going to last, that it is not going to satisfy me in the way that I wanted, that the world is never going to stop and freeze in place and be what I hoped it would be, and that as a result, to be a Christian who doesn't run away from the loss of all things, who actively takes up the work of sacrificing all things, that, as a practical matter, mostly looks like my continually engaging in the work of forgiving all things. In particular, forgiving the loss of all things. Forgiving even the loss of what I hoped things would be, even in the best of scenarios. Forgiving myself the fact that I have lost what I thought I wanted to be to one degree or another, in one way or another, professionally or religiously, uh, or in relationships with other people. Coming back again and again here to the work of forgiving all things. I think this also might prompt for us a really important shift in how we think about what it looks like to be a Christian disciple. A lot of time, I think, we're investing a lot of effort in trying to get God to forgive us, as if that's what being a Christian was about, trying to get God to forgive me. But I think at the end of the day, the actual work of being a Christian is exactly the opposite. The actual work of being a Christian is investing myself in continually forgiving all things, rather than trying to continually get myself to be forgiven of 
all things. Fantastic. The highest uh, compliment I can give to you and to all of the authors of the brief theological introductions to the Book of Mormon is that in wrestling with you as you wrestle with this treasured text, uh, this treasured scripture of ours, uh, I've changed. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm different. I'm a little bit different than I was before this uh, wrestling with you all, wrestling with this, with these holy things. How have you changed through um, writing the book? What's it meant to you to write it? In a very real way, I find myself transformed by the things that I write, especially this sort of thing. Uh, I find myself more sober and melancholy and attuned to loss than maybe I ever have been. I mean, this this may be partly connected to, to just the practical realities of the fact that here I am, middle-aged, <laughs> my children, my children grown or almost grown, my children leaving home or about to leave home, and they're not coming back. Uh, finding myself here in middle age exposed to the loss of my parents, to my loss of my father who died this summer, uh, exposed here in middle age to the fact that whatever kinds of professional goals I had for myself will almost certainly largely go unrealized, right? These whatever fantasies that had been propping me up to one degree or another to this point uh, are increasingly hard <laughs> to continue to put any faith in. And here all these things are passing away, my own body passing away out from, un out from underneath me, <laughs> right? My, my hair graying, my beard graying, my, my strength <laughs> failing. Uh, and here in the midst of it all, finding that the Christian response to all of this loss works. That if I can do what Christ asks me to do, if, like him, I can try to sacrifice all things, especially by forgiving the loss of all things, that even in the midst of all of this passing away, I can be part of the creation of something new, and I can be part of redeeming both the world and my own life and that all of that loss will not be sheer loss but that it can in God's hand work for the greater good uh, Adam thank you for being on the uh, Maximum Institute podcast again your, uh, your, your book's a gift and uh, I can't wait for the world to have it. It's called Mormon, A Brief Theological Introduction. And uh, very grateful for time with you, Adam Miller. Thanks. It is my pleasure. And, and let me just say by way of conclusion that uh, I am very grateful for the support the Maxwell Institute has given my work, both in these publications and in the Latter-day Saint Theology Seminar. Let me say that uh, on the record here publicly that I think you have done an absolutely astonishing job Spencer Fluman at retooling the Institute for the challenges of the 21st century uh, and I love you for it and let me say last of all that I love the Maxwell Institute podcast and uh, Blair has done an amazing often unsung job over these many years uh, and produced I think uh, a wealth of material that will bless people for for a long, long time to come. Thank you, brother. Uh, we love you. Grateful for the the time together, and uh, can't wait for the book to be in the world. Thanks again. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast. Coming up next, we're going to have James E. Faulkner on the mic. He's going to be interviewing Rosalind Welch. Rosalind Welch wrote the book Ether, A Brief Theological Introduction, and Jim Faulkner was one of the editors on that book. They'll sit down together and talk about the process and the product. 
Before we go, I want to check out a couple of reviews of the month here. We got one from Scott K. Hicks that says, The Adam Miller interviews are my favorites, slightly biased, but I've enjoyed them all, and I'm pushing to be a completist. All right, thanks, Scott. I hope you liked this interview with Adam as well. I think he's been on the podcast more than anybody else has. Uh, we got another review here from He Calls Me Shell. This one says, My heart and mind love this equally. I cannot overstate how much I enjoy this podcast. I've yet to find an episode that doesn't interest me. Here I find beautiful people offering us their human faith and intellect with graceful vulnerability. Thank you. Well, thank you, he calls Michelle. Thanks for taking the time to write that review. It means a lot to us. If you'd like to rate and review the podcast, you can do that in Apple Podcasts. I think that's the only place where people write reviews. But we also have people leaving comments here and there. I usually see one from Georgia born over on YouTube. Always leaves a, a kind comment after each episode. I appreciate that as well. All right. Well, we'll be back next time with James E. Faulkner talking with Rosalind Welch about Ether, A Brief Theological Introduction.